this next content is on classification and I don't know if you remember way back when lecture three or four we, I briefly mentioned it and mentioned that we weren't going to cover it at that time but um, now that we sort of gone through all the details of the model building exercise we can address this now if you remember back this was the setup this is a slide from you know, lecture three apparently um, and this was just showing you how regression, which we have been talking about for the last several lectures, is basically the same as, cl at class as classification at some level. So you have a bunch of regressors and you're trying to model some w y variable or output variable and the only difference is in regression this thing is takes on continuous values. Whereas in classification it's either you know A or B. And typically rep we represent that as a zero or one in terms of the data course you can have more than one more than two classes but that's just an extension of classification so at some fundamental level classification um, is basically the same as a regression it's just that when it comes to the details it turns out substantially different so in this lecture we're going to go through some of those um, types of classific classifiers and we'll go through some of the details there so um, and just at a high level if you remember going back to this lecture again, there were these issues that we've now covered. Uh, each of these co corresponded to one of the lectures. So he, this, remember this first one was just thinking about the possible models we could fit. And then we went through how do you actually fit and what does that mean and how do you minimize squared error in the case of regression in Gaussian noise. And then we went through cross-validation and bootstrapping essentially as resampling techniques that you can use to sort of quantify these different aspects of models. And so all of these issues we looked at in the context of regression models, but they also apply uh, when we talk about classification models, and we'll get to some more of that detail in a second. So let's just start off with some simple, well, I guess in this case the definition, and then we'll go through some simple examples. So it's always good to start simple, and linear models are a good place to start for um, these types of models. So here's a simple specification of a linear classification model and it may look complicated but it's really quite simple so we already understand the idea of weighted sums of regressors so just looking at this part of the equation let's not worry about the rest of it this is just a summation um, over however many regressors we might have so we have n regressors so i ranges from one through n and x sub i is just the um, uh, the the ith the ith reg regressor and there's n of them and each regressor is going to have some associated weight with it and remember that's what we are trying to do when we fit models we're going to optimize the weight um, associated with each regressor and so this is just so this term by itself would just be regression where your prediction for the the data point is just a linear combination of the re regressors that you throw at the problem and so the only difference now is we're going to subject this thing to one additional step. It's basically a thresholding operation. So there's some threshold C. So C is a, just a, con a parameter, um, some number. And we're going to say if, that if this weighted sum is less than that number, we're going to predict, the model is going to predict at the end zero. Just, and we just associated that arbitrarily with, with one, of the, one of the two classes that we're dealing with, in this case, a two class example. And then if if, on the other hand, the weighted sum is greater or equal to that constant, the prediction will be that the, that, that data point y is in the other class. So there's a, there's a binarization happening here that we're trying to predict whether, um, for any given data point, it, whether it's labeled is 0 or 1. And we're going to use a simple thresholding idea to make that decision. But before that thresholding is sort of the, the heart of the matter, and this thing is a linear it's a linear model, right? It's a weighted sum of one or more regressors, in this case, n regressors. So aside from this thresholding step, it's exactly the same as, as we saw in the case of linear regression models. Okay, so this is a little abstract and we'll get through to in a second how this is in actually quite intuitive. So, here are some examples, and I've put it in the context of we'll do a direct comparison against regression, which we're more familiar with. 
So we have a little two by two design here and this column will have some regression cases which should look familiar. We'll have some classification cases over here and what we're modulating here is essentially how many regressors we're using in the model. In this case we're going to use one, in this case we're going to use a two. So let's start with the simple case. It should look very familiar. You have one thing you measured, x, and you're trying to use that to predict y. Your data points are in red, and you might fit a line, and that line looks like this for these data. And that line has a specific equation we could write out, y equals ax plus b, right? So x is a regressor, and there's also an implicit constant regressor, and for this line that we've fit here, the weights are one half and one, and you can verify that I drew this plot correctly if you wanted to, and confirm that that line is that line. All right, so this is a simple case of regression. The y variable is continuous. It can be, you know, 1 or 1 1.1, 1 1.5, 1 2, 2.5, and so forth. And in this particular case, the model does pretty well explaining the, the y variable. So that's pretty straightforward, right? That's what we've seen. So now we have, let's think about what happens when we go into this box. So how do we convert this, in some sense, to a classification type case? So here's my little visualization of that. It's a little awkward looking, but we'll, we'll, we'll step through it just so it should become clear. So we still have x, and we're still trying to predict, classify essentially our data points, our y, the y values of our data points. The y values are either 0 or 1. So this could be male or female or dumb and smart or whatever you're measuring. And we're trying to use x to inform our decision, of our prediction of what the classification for each data point is. And in this case, I'm drawing this black line, and that is our, in some sense, our model. So our model that I just, in this example, is if the x thing is less than 2, we're going to guess that y is 0, and if it's greater or equal to 2, our guess is 1. So you can draw that as a simple step function. So whenever x is 2 or less, or less than 2, you get this prediction, the y prediction is 0, 0, 0, 0. And when it, when this, as soon as x is at 2 or beyond, our prediction is 1. So if you go look at the data points then in this example, that's a pretty good model for the data points. It gets all of this data point is correctly classified. This one is, this one, this was, this one is. And these, only a couple are misclassified here. These are labeled 0, but the model says the prediction is um, 1 up here. And up on this side, all of these data points are correctly fit or correctly classified. Um, whereas this one is not. But on the whole, most of the data points are correctly fit by the model. And you can just see, you know, vis intuitively, it's the exact same thing that's happening in regression. Regression, you try to get close to the y value. You remember our, the metric typically is squared error, so take the residual, square it, that's kind of like badness. You want to minimize that. Whereas in classification, things are binarized, so then you're either like right or wrong for a two case example. So all of these data points, the model is, there is no residual. You correctly said class one, so that's correct. And then these are correct, and then just a, a couple are, are miss incorrect. All right, so there's this concept now of decision boundary. So we can think of, given this model, symbolized by this black line, it essentially is plopping down a, a boundary that separates zero and one. And so that boundary in this case is at 2. So to the left of 2, prediction is class 0. To the right of 2, prediction is class 1. So I just draw that as a little vertical blue line here. All right. And just as in regression, I mean, there are many possible lines that we could try to draw through these data points. Some are worse than others. I could draw a you know, diagonal line this way, and that would be a horrible fit for these data. Likewise, in classification, I could put my decision boundary at 5, and that would be a really bad model. Because if my boundary was at 5, it would predict class 0 for all of these data points. And yes, it's correct for maybe half of them, but it's completely wrong for the other half. So that's a bad model. So we can twiddle this decision boundary. In other words, twiddle our parameters. It's the exact same thing to sort of optimize our performance for the data set. OK, pretty, does that make sense? All right, so that's one dimensional case. And actually, it looks nicer if we go to two dimensions. And maybe that's why I did this in the, this example. So now we're going to look at a two dimensional case um, for the case of regression. And I don't think we use these kind of visualizations 
previously, but um, so it's kind of new here, even for the regression. So we have two regressors, x1 and x2. That's along the x and y axes. And we're trying to predict the y variable, which is symbolized here using color. All right, so y is in, in, on this color bar, and it ranges from maybe negative 2 to 14. So let's just go through what the elements are here. So the data points are, in, are the, given by these circles. So the color of a circle, and we could do this in MATLAB too, if you want to play with visualization, we'll, we'll, we'll go through that. But the, each data point now has a specific x1 and y2 coordinate. So this data point, for example, is at 3.5 for x1 and about 2.8 for x2. So those are the two sort of explanatory variables. And the y value, if you can kind of visualize by eye, the color is 8, say. So this data point, we're trying to get the model to fit or fit the value 8. And, and so we can, do, we can plot all the other data points uh, just like this using color to represent the, the y variable. So that's, that explains all the dots. And then now let's talk about the underlying color here. So there's a gradient, as you can tell, from black to white here. It's a very smooth gradient. And so the gradient here is symbolizing the specific model that I'm displaying here. So just like in this plot, I use a simple black line to show you what the model fit is. Here I'm using this little gradient. And the gradient is colored using the exact same color bar. So the model is very low here. Um, maybe negative two down here, and then it grows, gets larger um, in, in a smooth linear fashion, actually, um, and it gets high up here. So this is a 14. So that's that explains what this underlying gradient is. And then the final bit on this figure are these these uh, slightly oblique vertical lines, off vertical lines. So those lines are tied to this gradient, and they're just plotting iso contour lines. So it joins points on this plane that have the exact same value. So looking at the gradient, all of these are slightly light gray, kind of like 12 or something. So there's a line there to kind of show you the contour of the surface. So this is actually a plane, just like a sheet of paper, that's rising mainly toward the right, but slightly upward. And if you plot little contours on that piece of paper or that flat plane, they look like this, just to kind of give you a sense of what the what the orientation of this plane is. OK, so we have some data, and we have the model. And I guess by eye, it's hard to tell that the model um, is a good fit for the data. But in this case, they are. Um, is that, does everyone see that? So the data points, if you just concentrate your attention on the, the dots, they, get, they go from dark to light. See that in the dots? And then that's matched by the plane, which is also going from dark to light. So that should give you some convincing that it is fitting the data well. So just like the, this, line, this black line is fitting these, the y values pretty well here, the exact same thing is happening in this case. It's just a different visualization. OK. All right, and the specific equation of that line, if you're curious, is just 2x1 plus x2. So remember, this is just y equals Con weight times one regressor plus weight times the other regressor. Here the weight's implicitly one. And you could imagine there was a constant regressor, but the weight on that is just zero. So this is still a linear model. It's just now we're dealing with two input variables. And this is what I, I guess for the most part we've been dealing with this case just because it's easier to, to look at than this case. But the mechanics are exactly the same since they're both linear. All right, question? Uh, so if the model fits the data well, yeah, in this visualization, I mean, it's not great, very intuitive, but yeah. So this, this, the, the y value for this data point right here is, um, is approximately 11, maybe, if that's the same color as that. And the model fit is given by this underlay. And so this model is also achieving something like near 11. Whereas, you know, if imagine rotating the underlay by, you know, 90 degrees, it would be completely off relative to the, to the data. Okay, and mainly the reason I put this up is so we can have this next plot, which is the kind of equivalent case, but in classification land. <laughs> so let's explain this now. Same two variables, x1 and x2. And in fact, I think the exact same data points. Yeah. So the x1 and x2 coordinates, uh, 
in this uh, subplot here are exactly the same as in this sub this plot. Um, but the difference is the coloring of the dots. So now I'm using white and black to represent class one and class two. So again, it could be male, female, or whatever you are trying to classify here. And so the, the data, the Y values are given by the color, black or white, and these are the data points. And then the last part of this figure is just this one line, this decision boundary line. And there's an analog to what we saw earlier. Um, I'm not plotting kind of the fit because the fit is kind of implied by the decision boundary. So what this is saying is in this, two, in this plane, this 2D space given, defined by X1 and X2, um, to one side of this decision boundary, the, the prediction of the model is that you belong to class zero, say black. So on this side of this decision boundary, everything here is classified as class zero or black, and then everything to the other side of the decision boundary over here is predicted or classified to be class one or white. All right, so what's happening is this model, there's a model underlying this and it's also linear and you just sort of think about what happened over here. Over here we had a plane that rose, that it was a linear plane so it didn't curve, it was just constantly moving in one direction, kind of rightward and upward. Imagine cutting that plane at one of the, its contours. So one of its contours would have been right here, which is, I don't know, six. Oh, look, it is six. So if you took that plane at and looked at all the points where at which it equaled six, so the y value was six, and sort of binarized the plane at that point, then you would have seen that everything below six would have been all the, this section of the plane out to the left, and that is just set to all one value, say zero, and then everything above that contour at six is set to this other value of one. And so that's the thresholding operation. We're taking a linear combination of our uh, explanatory variables, our regressors, 2x1 plus x2, and that shows up here. And all we're doing is saying, let's say six is the threshold. And if you do that, then that immediately defines that this line as the decision boundary, and things below are set to zero, or predicted to be zero, and things above are predicted to be one. And so if you look at that decision boundary, now look at that with respect to the data. So think about black and white and whether they're nicely separated by this line, they are. So everything in black to the left of this blue line is correct. Everything in white to the right of this blue line is correct. So there's only a couple of misclassified points like these guys. So these black dots here are on the wrong side and these white dots here are on the wrong side. But as a whole, most of the dots are on the correct side. So that kind of leads to this idea of what is our metric or how well can these models do. So typically you express it in terms of percent correct. So like in regression world you thought about squared error and like variance explained and all that stuff. But in classification world you, you think about percent correct. So we can go through that briefly on this example here. So I don't know how many points there are. Let's say there's uh, 30 data points here. So out of 30 data points how many were correctly fit or classified by the model. Um, so what you would do is say for this data point, the Y value was actually one, the fit was one, so correct. So that, that's good. And you go for each data point, correct, 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 and so forth. And eventually you'll go down and quantify this black dot here and you'll say the Y value was zero, the model predicted it to be one, that's incorrect. So you just count the number of correct classifications divide by the number of total data points, and that gives you a fraction. Then you can multiply by 100 to get a percentage if you want. So we're trying to get that fraction to be high. That's all. And so again, you might imagine a different model. So if you twiddled these weights a little bit, this line basically moves around. So as you move around, then you more or less or you get better or worse class percent correct depending on where the line is. I think in this case this is the optimal or close to the optimal um, fit for these data. Any questions on that?
So does everyone see how classification is related to regression, but how they're the same, but how they're actually different? <laughs> Both are important. No, so, well, to be, for simplicity, we're dealing with a binary case, so y is one of two values, but you can imagine there's three Any or four. Hmm? Any yeah, categorical data, where, and you might have more than two categories, and that is okay. Okay, so, so, so far we've, done simple examples. These are all linear type models and we only dealt with, of course, a couple of dimensions just because that's easy to look visualize. So one, um, one issue is your data may or may not be linear and what that means is your data may not conform to the what linear models can describe. So remember in regression again these examples it may be a u-shaped curve right and u is not a straight line so then we dealt with all these issues of like how do you how do you in, instead of using standard linear regression how would you tackle trying to model nonlinear data like that so in the classification the exact same issues arise um, and there's this idea which we kind of already saw but we'll hear it again and make you remember it um, of tackling those kinds of nonlinear cases by expanding your repertoire of regressors. Remember, in, we, we went through the case of simple quadratic models. So you can, if your data is not aligned but quadratic, then all you have to do is add x squared, say, into your model. So instead of y equals ax plus b, you can start fitting the model y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And so you can do that in classification just just the same. So, so let's go through some examples here. So this is our simple case of uh, data that's well described by a linear model, in this case a linear classification model. So we have two sets of data points, they have different Y labels, black and white, and here I'm using a, sim a line to divide the space into two parts, and in this case they're, all the data points are perfectly classified. And it's linear because again Think weight, weighted sum of regressors, you know, weight times x1 plus weight times x2, and, and this we can write it like in exactly that form. So here the weights are both 1. And because we can write in that form, that makes it linear, and linear models look like, well, in this two dimensional space, a straight line that defines the boundary between what is black and what is white. And so for these data, it's perfectly fine. It seems to fit the data well. So now we can go through this alternative case of where such a model would not do well. So ignoring the blue curve for a second, just think about the data points. So there are a bunch of black data points over here and a bunch of white data points over here. And notice they're cleanly separatable in some sense. It's not like all the data points are mixed together. There's a clear separation. It's just that, it's just that the separation is not a linear separation. So imagine, again, ignore the, the blue line here, but imagine you could plop down any line you wanted, could you ever perfectly divide the space into only black dots and only white dots? I mean, you could get close. You could draw a vertical line maybe right here at x1 equals 1, and that would get most of the black dots correct and get most of the white dots correct, but there would definitely be some errors. All right, so, to do, and then, so now let's talk about what this blue, this blue line is just a different model. So this blue line is a decision boundary, it's just not linear, it's curvy. And what this is saying is to one side of this blue line, so sort of this side of this line is uh, prediction to be a, a white or class one, and then, er and then the other side of the boundary is all the class zeros or black. And so given that boundary, notice it perfectly classifies the available data points. And so go look, go, uh, looking at the the description of that model. That model says, again, it's a function of our input re regressors that we, we sort of start with them, but there's this squaring happening, which immediately makes it nonlinear. So this is saying, if you take the x1 coordinate and subtract off the square of the x2 coordinate, and if it's less than zero, then your prediction is zero. And then 
on the other side, if it's greater or equal to zero, then you're going to predict one. And this equation, this specification, is exactly what corresponds to this um, visualization here. We could, if I guess more of exercise, so this threshold, I mean, in some sense, you could visualize the nonlinear linear model before the threshold. So just like in the previous example, we could look at um, this plane before we decided to cut it at 6. You could kind of do that for this example. You could plot this function, x1 minus x2 squared, before the threshold and just sort of visualize that. It's going to have this weird curvy sh uh, shape. And then you can kind of see that, ah, if we cut it at a specific threshold level, then it gives us this parabola-looking uh, decision boundary. <laughs> okay, so all that's happening here, just like we saw in regression, we still have a linear model in some sense. It's just that we're using a new regressor. We just conco concocted x1 squared, right? Because there's a weight on x1, this x1. Um, oh, sorry, that's x2. There's a weight on this one, it's 1. And there's a weight on this regressor, which is x2 squared, and that's negative 1. Um, so thought about in that fashion, we're doing the exact same thing as we, as we did earlier. We're expanding, that's what this means, expanding our input space or adding new regressors into our model, um, which are not linear things. So squaring is not a linear thing. But once we add that into our model, then after that, our model is a linear model. And that allows us to do nonlinear things. Make sense? OK, so now oh, that's exactly what I was just saying. So if you think of your new space as having, instead of the only two, the original two regressors are x1 and x2. But if we just add to our repertoire four more regressors, so just all pairwise products of our original two variables, so that includes x1 squared, x2 squared, as well as, I'm oh, sorry, that's only three more. <laughs> Adding three uh, variables, the cross product as well as the individual variable squared, that gives us a five-dimensional space. Then we can start fitting models in this five-dimensional space, and we can start doing things that look like this. So this last example is just, a, just additional example just to show you the diversity of uh, results that you can get. So here again we have some data points, some are 0, some are 1. Can we draw a line that separates the black dots and the white dots? Nope. Well, a straight line rather. You can't draw a straight line that does it well. But you can draw a circle, and if you draw this circle, everything inside the circle is white correct and everything is outside is black and that perfectly s classifies these data points what's the equation for a circle x squared plus y squared equals you know remember that from geometry but in this case or we don't have well y is the thing we're predicting so really we have x1 and x2 so then you can do x1 squared plus x2 squared and if you threshold at a correctly so less than one would be the radius you know this is like it's like Euclidean distance, the square of the radius. Anyway, <laughs> um, anyway, so this, if you, if you, if you, this is the equation that underlies this decision boundary, and notice that it actually comes from the same space that we kind of did in this example. If you just expand with the square of each variable as well as the product, and now you have a five-dimensional space. This model is actually just one f specific set of weights from that five-dimensional space, right? So. The weight on x1 squared is 1. The weight on x2 squared is 1. And the weight on all these other terms is just 0. So we don't even write them out here. But you can think of it as implicitly having, um, having weights of 0 in this model. So we can achieve this power of describing nonlinear behaviors by this simple expansion of the input space. That's the upshot of this slide. Any questions on that? What kind of data might you get for that last one? The circle? What might it, what kind of data might s mediate, or not mediate, uh, generate this type? Um, so it, it's the same as like U-shaped 
stuff. So think about some, I don't know, we're in psychology, so something that gets better, that's maximized at some medium value and then drops off with, so like, I don't know, intelligence probably, or not intelligence, but performance. Middle-aged people are maybe optimal, and if you're too young or too old, you drop off. So that's one, that's one dimension. So that shows, that's a nonlinear function, right? Worse to better to worse. And then if you just add one other variable into that, uh, I don't know, some other variable involved that where you're also worse, better, worse, um, then that would generate something like this. So, the, so in that sense, these would be high performers and these would be low performers. Then you measured uh, two U-shaped functions. So if you multiply two U-shaped functions, you get kind of this parabola. Then if you threshold that parabola, you know, you get something like this. maximum margin. So that comes later. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, but I guess more generally the question is why yeah, for this metric. The, 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 the threshold is a little bit linear, not lenient when you use the Lenient? So this metric of percent is lenient? Um, I'm not sure what lenient means, but it's definitely true that, you know, getting this guy correct, this data point correct, is treated exactly the same as getting this guy correct, even though in some sense it's harder, you know, it's so close to the other side, but these guys are treated equally. So yeah, so certainly the metric uh, has certain weird or interesting characteristics, and we could invent whatever metric we wanted to if we um, wanted. So like, I, I no, one thing you could do, sort of, it's outside the scope of the model itself, but given a set of data, you might you know, for any given study that you're trying to learn about stuff, you might actually care about the hard subjects rather than the easy subjects. So you could kind of focus in and compute percent correct for the data points just around the middle or something. And, you know, so there's, anyway, well, we'll get to the margin sec idea in a second. All right, so, so now, so, so far we've been just dealing abstractly with linear class classifiers as well as how you can achieve nonlinear boundaries just by doing linear classifiers but in the expanded space. Um, and I guess the logis logistics, that's a bad word since we're going to talk about logistic reg regression, but the, there's different specific types of classifiers and we're going to survey a but, uh, several of them and they're all kind of very different. But in some sense, they're all the same because they're all, well, in the way we'll describe them, they're all in the end linear. So what I'm saying is, let's go through this case. So given these data, right, black and white are the data, and we're trying to draw a line in this case that separates them. If, if you're restricted to drawing a straight line, then in some sense, that's easy to understand because you're only fitting a linear model. And we're, the only thing we're talking about is how do you determine the weights that describe where that linear model lives. So in other words, right, this blue line, it has a very specific location. If I were to move that line to the right or to the left or rotate it, to do that, all I'm doing is, are, is changing these weights. So instead of 2, 1 for the weights on x1 and x2, I, if I change it to 1, 1, that'll just move this decision boundary. Or if I change it to 2.9, that'll change it. So when we're talking about all these different flavors of classifiers, to the extent that they're all linear models, then we're really just talking about how you determine those weights. And so you can kind of think of that as a detail, but of course important details. Um, that kind of, but that's a general similarity that unifies all these different types. So the first type we're going to talk about is logistic regression. And it's a little confusing because it says regression in, in the name, but it's not, it, it is regression in some loose sense, but where you're going to use it to perform classification. 
Um, and so the, the, the first concept here is the logistic function. So the logis logistic function is just a like standard math function formula. Um, it's, it's just a one-dimensional function. So given some uh, input A, you just do this to it. So what's happening? You're dividing, you're adding, you're using the natural na uh, the e constant. I forget what the heck. It's the natural natural log is the yeah using that. But it, what is e called? Like Euler's number. number. Yeah, sounds about right. I should use two point seven one something. But what is it called? Help x exponential. But what is e? I guess I could Google it later. Anyway, um, anyway, e is a constant. So the only thing that's happening is division, addition, and exponentiation, and changing the sign. So this is just a function. All right, let's just look at it. So given a, it's just some number, some real number. We're going to look at f of a, where you compute it like this, and that function looks like this. So it's a monotonic function. It starts near 0, rises, and ends up near 1. And a crucial point, I'm going to indicate that with dotted line, um, is a equals 0. So when a is 0, we can just plug it in. a is 0, negative 0 is 0, e to the 0 is 1, 1 over 1 plus 1 is 1 half. So when a is 0, we're exactly halfway between 0 and 1. That's kind of an important um, point because we're going to use this function to do classification and ultimately we're going to say when this function is above 0.5 that's we're going to predict class 1 and then and if we're below 0.5 on this y axis we're going to predict class 0. So we have this function it maps so it conceptually is important because it maps continuous valued input so a can range from negative whatever negative infinity to infinity but it, this function, what it does is maps that on into a very confined space. Everything's between 0 and 1. And you can kind of think of it as almost doing the discretization for us. As I said, we, we're going to treat you know, 0.7 ultimately as a prediction of class 1. And things below 0.5, like 0.2, is class 0. So this is a, what's called a squashing function. It kind of squashes a, a continuous valued range onto a restricted range. So we have this function, and we want to use this function to do, to fit some sort of um, classification model. So then we can get into what is logistic regression. So it's given by this formula here. So we're going to use sort of the innards here is what we've always, what we've seen time and again, which is a weighted sum of our regressors, right? This inner part is the linear part. And the only thing we're going to do that's different from ordinary regression is plop that through our logistic function given by f. So remember the previous slide, we just used f as our function name. We're going to put that linear combination through f, which just expands out just like this. So 1 plus, sorry, 1 divided by 1 plus e to the negative a, in this case, A is this big expression, this weighted sum, so we're just going to put it up there. So as soon as you do that, Y takes on some interesting characteristics. Whereas before this little squashing function, you know, weighted sum of our regressors, assuming X is our unbounded and continuous, et cetera, et cetera, then this inner part was, would just take on, you know, you could go out far and you can get Y values that are really big and really small. And as soon as you pass it through this logistic function, now y is bounded between 0 and 1. So it starts becoming more like the classifier world. So that is the model. That's all it is. And now the only remaining part is how do we kind of use this to fit it? How do we take this model and make it fit our data? So the mechanics, I'll just briefly mention, not too important, but if you're inclined, you can go through it. Uh, the mechanics kind of work exactly like we saw back when we were talking about least squares and Gaussian noise and regression and all that. So if you remember, 
you probably don't remember, but if, if you remember, um, in regression, if we assume things like Gaussian noise and independence across data points, then we can go through this derivation that shows us that if we want a model that maximizes the likelihood of the data, some terms that hopefully rings a little bit, but if you do that, you can show that that's equivalent to minimizing squared error. So minimizing squared error is easy to think about, and we implicitly do it all the time. And that corresponds to this interpretation of where, you know, if we assume Gaussian noise and so forth and maximize the likelihood, and that's, that's their kind of equivalent. So we can use that exact same idea, but in this, for this new model. And the, the key difference is we're not minimizing squared error anymore, but we're going to kind of change our model for the um, the noise. So the intuition then is this logistic function, you know, spits out 0 or 1 and also spits out like 0.7 and 0.2. So you, let's think of those values as probabilities. So imagine we have a logistic function with parameter set and it's it's outputting a value that's 0.9999. So that function is kind of telling making a claim about the probability of the data point being class one. So if you're 0.9999, you're essentially very close to one. So you can think of that as saying, I predict there's a 0.999 chance that a data point out there will actually be class one. So you can kind of interpret the values outputted by the logistic function as probabilities. And once you do that, then you can start using this maximum likelihood idea. So just in words, what's happening is we can write out for a set of data. So what's the likelihood of our data points given some model? And we just through some math notation, uh, we're going to assume all our data points are independent. So you have a 30 subjects, we'll just treat each subject as an independent draw, right? So we can say that likelihood of our complete data set is just the product. So this big pi symbol is just, it's just like summation, except we're not summing, we're multiplying. So we're just going to uh, index through the data point, the data point, the data points we have, and we're just going to say the likelihood is just a product of all our individual data points likelihood. So d sub j is the jth data point, and p is just you know probability of. So we haven't done anything; we just written it in mathematical notation. So we're just going to multiply all the individual data points probability, and then the key step is this last bit, which is what is the probability of some data point? Well, it's just we're going to play a little game here. So the data point, let's assume, is coded between either 0 or 1, right? Class 0 or class 1. So let's do an easy case first. So suppose the data point was known to be class 1. So d sub j is 1. So this is just 1. So if this is 1, then this is also 1. And this 1 minus 1 is 0. So this whole term goes away. So we can just ignore that for a second. So we're just left with this term. So if this is 1, the rest of this is just y sub j. So y is just our notation to indicate the output of the model. So y is kind of like a probability value. So this is saying, given this logistic model, the probability that of this of one particular data point, which was class 1, is just given by y sub j, which is just the output of the model. So it's just like saying the model is 0.99 at this data point. So the likelihood of that data point is 0.99. That's, that's all that's happening here, just some mathematical notation to, to say that. So that's one data point. Then you do that for all the data points. So you go to a different data point. The logistic model says 0.1, so outputs 0.1 for that data point. So our interpretation then is the likelihood of that data point being class 1, so that would be this case. So this would be 1, and then y sub j would be 0.1. So the likelihood is very low, so that's bad. So if we observe class 1 for a, 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 a point that where the logistic model says 0.1, that's a bad thing. On the other hand, if the, logistic, if the class label for that was 0, then we kind of switch, switch to this other term. So if d sub j is just the data point was 0, then anything to, this to the 0 is just 1. So this term goes away, and then now we're on this side. So this just um, 1 minus 0 is 1. So then what we're left with is 1 minus the output of the the logistic. So that's a little confusing. I guess I could draw it out. But the, all, the point is that this is just essentially multiplying probabilities together based on the output of the logistic 
function. And so essentially, you're going to want a, a you want a specific setting of the weights in a logistic function such that class one has high predictions from the model, like 0.9 is good or 0.9 is even better. And you want data points that are class zero to have very low outputs from the logistic function, like 0.1 or 0.2 or 0 0.1, or I just said that, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 or 0 0.01. <laughs> and this is just a way of writing out formally what the total likelihood of your set of data points is. Um, question? Oh, yeah, so, so I understand what conceptually what's going on, but could you go over like what the notations are like, that are referred to? Like, oh, yeah, I'll just say it one more time. So D is just kind of our whole collection of data. M is some model that has been specified, so some specific setting of the weights and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, I also use M to indicate the number of data points, so ignore that. I should fix that. So J ranges over each, the index of each data point, and we're just producting, multiplying together the individual probability associated with each data point. So P is just probability of, and D sub J is the, the Jth data point. So D is really just 0 or 1. And then over... No, 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 no. Just like inferring given data point. Yeah, so the probability of one data point is one of these, and we're going to multiply that with the probability of the next data point. So it's one big long multiplication. Oh, okay. Uh, this is only okay because there's two data points. Independent, yeah. And so over here, the notation is the y's are the output of the logistic model. So they range between 0 and 1. And that's it. I mean, if you if you really wanted to to we'll, we'll go, we can go through an actual example of how you would write this out for any given data set. But but the point is, once you can write it out like this, you know, the exercise was just to get a formal expression for the likelihood, and then the fitting is just this trick of let's take the log to deal with some of the math, math and take the negative, and essentially it reduces this. Let's not worry about the details right now but just like in the case of the Gaussian and regression you you want to find a model that minimizes the neg log likelihood and it turns out after some math that that's the model that minimizes the squared error so they're equivalent in this case we have this expression we take the log we take the negative it reduces to this and again we want some model the specific model that minimizes this big expression Right, so the big picture is we have this, we have some data, these points, and we're trying to move this, this, this line around. So we want the specific set of weights that optimizes this criterion, specifically minimizes this, 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 this metric. And this pi symbol? Oh, I don't know what it's called. You it's just like instead of sigma, it's like sums up, pi is multiplied to sigma. They do iterate. Oh, yeah. But is that its name? Pi? It looks like pi, but it's a big pi. <laughs> so, I mean, the big picture is logistic regression. You can think of its continuous, it is a continuous output, right? It's, you can get 0.2 and 0.7, but you can treat of those. I, you can interpret that as, as probabilities. And so it makes sense that you kind of want to, you know, adjust the placement of the decision boundary so that things that are class one are near the region where it outputs high values, like 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So does the logistic function that you apply to your data, does it push your boundaries further away so that it makes it easier to classify, like, as opposed to just not applying the logistic function? E does it push points away? Um, like, does it push it towards, like you had in the logistic function? Let's say you had a classifier as like one and negative one. Mm -hmm. Is the reason why we use this function is because it, like, let's say it's like a point six versus a point four? Yeah, I, I, I think I know what you're getting at. I think once I show you the example, it'll become clear. So the short answer is it doesn't really, doesn't really matter because if in the end you binarize this thing, that distinction, you know, whether you're close to this danger zone versus far away from the danger zone, it kind of doesn't matter. 
assuming you're binarizing. And well, let's, I think that that's what we're gonna see right here. Yeah, okay. So that was just um, a little bit of detail on logistic regression, and here's a simple example. And we're gonna see a lot more examples, so that's why this is small. So we have two regressors, x1 and x2, and finally we have a case of where the data is pretty hard to separate. So we have all our data points and the class labels indicated by color. And so let's imagine we're trying to use a linear classifier to separate these data. And as you can see by eye, it's, it's doable, just you won't get great. We'll get pretty good performance. All right, so we could just use our brain and draw the line, or we could try to get MATLAB or whatever program you want to use to fit, determine what's the optimal line. But now let's think specifically about logistic regression. What logistic regression does is, is there some linear combination of x1 and x2 such that when you pass it through this little squashing function, it gives you a prediction that maximizes the likelihood of this data, where that means you know computing this formula and so forth. So we can once we do this, we'll, we'll go into the mechanics of how you would do it, but Here's that model. So what I'm plotting here are contours. So these are isocontours, but now of our logistic function that I have fit to these data. So the structure of this of this surface, there's kind of a surface, it's kind of a squashing plane. So this plane starts off at zero. So there's this last contour that's basically black. And so everything out here and to the left is just a flat horizontal plane. So there's a plane here that's basically flat, and it's flat until you start getting to this regime, and then it starts ramping up. So it's kind of like a, a smooth step function. So it starts going up because you see these contours here. You, you, know, you get to 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And then at some point after the ramping, it hits one, and then it's just asymptotes out. So there's this kind of smooth step that has a certain orientation, of course, right? It's not purely horizontal, it's not purely vertical, but it's kind of slightly vertical, mostly horizontal. And this function, we get this function just by evaluating that logistic function. Um, and yeah, okay, so I'm visualizing the fit that I've determined. I've determined these weights just by doing this minimization of the negative log likelihood bit, uh, but don't worry about that yet. But we have this function now and once we have this function, that function tells us how to classify our data now. Because all we do is, and I just did it right here. So I just highlighted the 0.5 contour. So that's just the blue line here. So then we just say, if that function is greater than 0.5, we're gonna predict one. If it's less than 0.5, predict zero. And that makes sense from the probability point of view. right? If you think of those values as probabilities, if you have to, if you're forced to choose one, and the probability is 0.6 that it's class one, and likewise, or conversely, 0.4 that it's class zero, you're going to choose the most likely class. So that's where the binarization happens. Oh, so getting to your question about you know the danger cases. Um, one answer is how steep this function is. So right now it's a smooth step, but it's gradual over this range. So it takes some distance for it to ramp up. So you, the steepness of that function can be adjusted and it will affect the fitting of the model. So again, if you interpret it this way and you want to minimize this way, there's going to be some specific steepness of the logistic function that optimizes for these data. And so this steepness, as you see here, I think I actually fit it to the data, so it's real. You can imagine what would happen if you made, so let's, the easy case if, if it's too sh uh, shallow. So imagine it's this you know gradual step that comes up, but suppose it's super gradual. So suppose that it's zero all the way, you know, maybe if you go down here at zero, but in the middle, suppose you sort of gradual, gradualize <laughs> the slope such that in this range, 
suppose all the values are very close to 0.5. So maybe it ranges from 0.4 to 0.6 over this range. So in that case, in some sense, the prediction of the final model is the same, right? If you binary is at 0.5, you're still going to predict 1 and 0. But in terms of the continuous sort of probability interpretation, if the values only range from 0.4 to 0.6 in this range, that's bad for probability reasons, right? Because this particular model I illustrated here says these data points, like where I'm pointing at, that's already 0.9. And that's very good. That's going to make a high probability. We want to maximize the probability of our data. So it's good that the model is saying 0.9 and 0.99 for these guys. And if we had a shallow function instead, that would just say like eh, 0.6, 0.65, and those are not as big as 0.9. So that's kind of bad from a probability point of view. So the, the steepness of the function does affect the fitting and interpretation. But if you think of logistic regression as just basically binarizing ultimately, then it's not really going to affect that issue. Does that answer your question? OK, so this is just one specific um, type of classifier. And there are many other types. We'll just sort of briefly discuss some of them, just so you're familiar uh, with them, and so you can kind of think of them as all kind of related. So LDA, you probably have heard of, raise your hand if you have. Um, OK, so LDA, or linear discriminant analysis. So here's the example. So we have these. These are our data points. And of course, I've explicitly drawn them in some weird fashion just to demonstrate the example. You can apply LDA, of course, to this data, and it would give you a certain answer. But for these data, what LDA does is first considers each, considers the distribution of the data points within each class. That's kind of what it focuses on first. And so you can do that. And here, Specifically, what it does is it fits a specific type of model, in this case, a probability distribution to the data, right? We're, we're not fitting, we're not doing classification yet. And we're, think back to like histograms. When you do a histogram, you're kind of looking at the distribution of your data along one uh, variable. Here we have two variables, so now we have a multivariate distribution. We kind of looked at this when we talked about 2D histograms. Um, and so what LDA does is to assume that the data can be modeled as multivariate ga Gaussian distributions defined on the regressors, so in this case x1 and x2. So you can just think of this as a 2D histogram kind of. And this is saying, so let's just concentrate our attention on the black dots, this is saying that um, we expect data points to be very likely to be observed near the peak of this Gaussian, so right where my cursor is. And there's some likelihood that it's maybe out here, but at some point the probability, sort of the Gaussian, falls off, and it's very unlikely to observe black dots out here. And for this data set, of course, I specifically designed it to be like that, so that, that seems like a good model. So we see many data points around here and some tapering off, off here, but nothing outside there. So that's a very specific probability distribution. It's like this ball model. It's an elongated ball where things tend to be near the center of the ball and kind of falls off. right? And likewise, for the other class, and now let's just look at the white dots, the same kind of, the kind of model looks very applicable. They're kind of concentrated there, and they kind of fall off. And there's, so there's one additional assumption that LDA wants to make, which is that the shapes of these Gaussian distributions are exactly the same for the different classes. So data points that are 0, data points that are 1. Notice my elongated, So th sorry, what I'm plotting are contours. I'm using a lot of these contours just so we visualize it. But it's kind of like given this two-dimensional two -dimensional Gaussian plot a, a, a contour at where the value is, the height of the Gaussian is the same. And so that's wh why they look like ellipses here. But anyway, so the, the, if you assume that these two classes have the exact same shape, but they can differ in their means. So the mean, sort of the center value of the Gaussian can move around. Does this break if you're not using a shape Gaussian? Does it break? Well, kind of. It breaks insofar that how bad that is an assumption for the data. 
so if it's a horrible one then it I mean you can fit it and you'll get an answer it just may not be very good so once we have this model of the distribution of the data then what it does is it does classification because the idea is insofar that that's a good description of the data then it's easy because then we can just take these two Gaussians and ask what is the optimal boundary that separates these two Gaussians and that's just given by this line here so just so to kind of see that ignore all the data points let's assume that these little Gaussians are a good description of the data therefore we can ignore the data and then this 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 line here kind of is equally on if you kind of, if, essentially if you evaluate how high the Gaussians are at this blue line they're at equal height right this idea of probability are you more likely to be in this Gaussian or this Gaussian and to do that you evaluate how high the Gaussian is then you just compare so if you're out over here so where my cursor is negative six negative six you're pretty unlikely to be this Gaussian because you're way off in the tails and you're also pretty unlikely to be in, in the black Gaussian but relatively speaking you'll you'll guess black so right so the tails of course you're in the tails of both but you're way out in the tails for the white but only a little bit out in the tails for the black so you'll choose to be your more likely guess that you're in the black distribution so you can do that over the entire space and there is a line that separates all the points where that you would choose the black class so that would be to the left and then for all the other data points in the plane or for all not data points for all the, all the other points in the plane you would choose the the white distribution so the logic makes sense you first model the data distribution and then kind of then do classification by deciding based on those fitted Gaussians what is the optimal decision boundary All right, let's look at this one. It works best when the data is anti-correlated. Um, no, I'm not sure what you mean. Because isn't it contingent on like your, how your Gaussian is shaped, right? Like your LDA. Yeah, so LDA in standard form is going to try to fit the you can call it fitting the covariance. In other words, just allowing your Gaussian to have a certain spread. So in one dimension, it's easy to think about. It's just a standard deviation, kind of where there's the mean and standard deviation, right? So that's easy to think about. In two dimensions, it gets a little complicated because not only do you have means and standard deviations for each x1 and x2, you also have the cross. So it's like correlation between the two variables, and that's what gives rise to this kind of slanting stuff. So that's kind of that's an additional parameter. That's a aspect of these multivariate uh, distributions um, so I mean wh whether it's good or bad kind of depends on how Gaussian your data are that's kind of one factor and another factor is unless you use some fancier techniques it, it's also depending on how much data you have to estimate those Gaussians so if you have a, a thousand dimensional space and a hundred data points and you're trying to fit a multivariate Gaussian you can't really do it in the standard sense because you don't have enough data. So how well the, the technique is going to work it depends on a bunch of factors including those. Okay so another classifier and in a second we'll kind of reflect on all these different things. So here are some data and this is support vector machines or SVM kind of comes from machine learning type world and we want to separate these points of course so here's the answer how do you get that answer that's kind of what makes SVM different from all of these other ones so in SVM I, SVM here's the decision boundary and what SVM is doing is maximizing the margin so think of this I mean this isn't squared error it's not even probability really um, but it's a different you can think of it as a different metric and the margin is essentially the, the you look at the distance to so out of all the data points you go find the data points that's closest to the boundary so for example this black 
data point out of all the black points is the closest. So closest in a Euclidean sense, say. So I've just plotted a perpendicular line here from this dot to this line. So it has a certain distance, or you can give that as a margin. And it also has a margin to the this white data point. And in this case, they're their max so this line is is the line that maximizes this distance this margin from your data so you're trying to put your decision boundary somewhere that is as far away as uh, from the data as you can and the idea is that will probably give you a good boundary so for example if you plop down so there are many lines that you could have actually drawn on this on this figure to separate the points perfectly right I could have drawn a line that goes from here down through here and down through here down here so that is a great I mean that's fine and a percent correct is hundred percent seems fine but you can think about you know if your data is a little noisier or on some new new data set that particular line may not be optimally performing because you can imagine you know if I drew a decision boundary that is ever so slightly close to this guy so that like this line right here you can imagine, you know, you measure that subject again, and he, for whatever reason, plops over to the other side of that boundary. Then you start misclassifying him. So you can kind of think of noise in this, in this, in this input space of like these points can actually jiggle around a little bit for whatever noise reason. And so if that's an intuition for why you might want a decision boundary that's kind of as far away as the data points as you possibly can while still classifying them correctly because that'll make it robust in some sense to this kind of noise idea. Yeah. So how do you calculate the, the margin if like the, you don't have a clean separation? Yeah, if there's no clean separation between your data then you kind of throw in some <coughs> slack. They're called slack variables. So you can kind of look in this example. These two clouds are definitely not separable with one line, but you can define some sort of threshold on the margin within which it's okay for data points to be misclassified. And then outside of that margin, then you can start imposing. So, but that's, that's the short version. So this, this is a metric, right? It's kind of completely different from all these other ones, but you can still use it, right? I mean, if in the end you just care about getting percent correct high, then it's fine. You can maximize the margin and then that's what SVM does. And it seems in practice it does quite well. Okay, so I guess the next two are slightly different because they're not, oh, actually this next one is linear, so let's, let's, let's go through that one. So nearest prototype classification, kind of a um, cumbersome name, but it's actually the easiest of all of these. That's why I like it. Easiest and simple. It works well in practice. So here are some data, again, two classes, X1 and X2. What do we do to classify these data? Well, take all the black dots and compute their mean. <laughs> That's it. So you take the mean of all, so just look at the black dots and then they all have some x1 value. The x value, x1 variable is sometimes high, sometimes low. Just take the mean. Then look at the x2 value, sometimes high, sometimes low, take the mean. Then you just get this little plus sign here. That's, I just plot a, a marker at the mean of all the data points. Then you do the exact same thing for the white data points. They vary in x1, they vary in x2, just kind of what's the average value of both of those dimensions, those, those input variables. Okay, now we've just summarized all our data in terms of these two points, two data points. Then we say our prediction for any new subject or any old subject, whatever, that we can measure x1 and x2 for is, is if it's closer to this plus, that's my prediction is class zero. If it's closer to this plus, my prediction is class one. And formally that gives rise to this boundary. Just draw a line between these two markers and draw then draw a perpendicular plane. I mean, in higher dimensions, it'll be a plane. And that's it. So that'll separate your predictions of what is class one and class zero. In some sense, it's like LDA, right? We're kind of summarizing, describing our data and then doing the classification. So here we were a little sophisticated and not only got sort of the mean, but we also got this covariance structure, blah, blah, blah. Here we're just taking the mean, even dumber than LDA. And then 
we're just take, using the means to inform our classification. Yeah. So how do you, uh, just like, I guess like the, besides using uh, the Euclidean, Euclid Euclid this is like, I, I got, would you use other, other ways of calculating the distance? Yeah, other ways of distance. Um, you could. I guess Euclidean is nice because it's easy to understand and it makes sense. Um, but you certainly, but one, I guess one, okay, wh why wouldn't you want to use Euclidean for, I guess one case would be, in this case, we're just dealing with these two variables and we can kind of visualize all the data makes it is easy. But imagine you got 100 Xs, so 100 different variables that you're trying to use in some model. And imagine that, you know, 80 of them are complete garbage. If you measure Euclidean distance in that space of 100 dimensions and 80 of them is garbage, they're essentially adding garbage to your Euclidean distance. And then you might imagine your performance suffers because of that. So maybe you might want to choose a metric that ignores the garbage or downweights the influence of garbage dimensions. Um, that's kind of vague, I know. Let's see. So um, another, so Euclidean distance is, you know, pairwise differences squared and summed, and then square root. That's what distance is. Um, you might want to use a correlation. So correlation is related, except it's a little different. So correlation, remember, subtracts the mean of each vector and then scales each vector and then computes. So that, you know, might be useful if you kind of don't will care about the mean of the two things you're comparing. So you kind of get rid of the mean and then you compute correlation. That might be useful for, you know, depending on your data set. I know that these are all very abstract, but just kind of motivate some intuition of why you might want to use a different metric. Um, another one, another commonly used metric is angle. So think of, um, you have two things you're trying to compare, right? Instead of just measuring straight up distance between these two points, you can kind of treat them as points relative to zero those are like two vectors, then you can compute the angle between those two vectors. Typically done is cosine. So if, if the angle is close to zero, meaning they're almost at the same vector, cosine of zero is one. So you get output of one. If they're far away, then cosine of, if they're completely opposite, then cosine of 180 is negative one. So now your metric is between negative one and one. And that's a different way to compute similarity. It's different from distance. And so what's one way that that's different? Well, you can have two data points that are really far away in terms of distance, but that lie on the same vector from zero. So Euclidean distance will think, oh, those are completely different, whereas cosine of the angle will think, oh, they're identical. And so whether that's good or bad, again, just depends on the structure of your data. But if you have some quantity that you want to treat like a vector, like you don't care about how far from the origin it is, but you only care about angle from the origin, then that would be a a good scenario to use that metric. I guess uh, offline, well, I can draw you some simple <laughs> scatter plots that might conform to a cosine distance versus the Euclidean distances here. So just reflecting on these four. So these are all four kind of very different ways to analyze the data to get a classification matter. But in the end, they're all lines, right? Just look at the blue line. They're all just plopping down a line somewhere in your data to try to classify your, your data points. But this last bit is, this last one is a bit different in the sense that you're no longer just doing a line. But yet the technique is really, really straightforward. So it's nearest neighbor classification. So the idea is, what is the prediction for a new subject that has some x1 coordinate and x2 coordinate? Well, just go find the nearest data point in your data set that you have observed already, and then predict its class. So. If my data point I'm asking about it lies right there where my cursor is, the nearest data point in terms of Euclidean distance is that guy. And so I'm going to predict, oh, well, this, this data point will probably be class one. Or if I'm over here, my nearest data point is this guy. He's class zero, or she's class zero, so I'm going to predict class zero. That's it. So for, this, for these data, you apply that kind of idea. This turns out to be the decision boundary should make intuitive sense why this is happening. So in this regime here, all the way uh, above this kind of blue line, these are all kind of the black regime. All of this, the points in the space are closest. The nearest neighbor for all those points are is a black dot. Whereas all of the data points out here, the nearest point is a 
is a white dot. So even though it's quite simple, it already can do complex things like this nonlinear decision boundary. All right. So I should say, um, I guess we'll go through the mechanics of how it works, but remember all those usual things that we talked about, like bootstrapping, cross-validation, and fitting, and all that stuff, they also apply in, for these classification models. So for example, um, you might imagine bootstrapping. Let's just think about this example. This example, you have, I don't know, 100 data points or 50, and you want to know something about the reliability of your model parameters. So suppose you do this this type of model, nearest prototype, and you get these two centroids and they define um, this decision boundary, but then you want to know is that a stable decision boundary. So what you can do is just bootstrap this data. So draw a completely new sample from these data points, do your analysis, you know, compute the centroids, compute the line, and then do that many times. And then you'll get some, you know, that line will jump around a little, depending on you know, depending on how noisy your data are, how many data points you have, and so forth. And that's, but it's the same procedure. So you can do bootstrapping to sort of put error bars on, say, this decision boundary. Um, and then uh, cross-validation, you can imagine you could leave one out, do whatever technique you're applying, and then predict that one, and do it for all the, every data, single data point. And then you can quantify percent correct based on that. So the same old ideas apply 